I, I think that conservatives today uh, swim very much upstream and against a tide. Please, take your seats. Make yourself comfy. I, um, I am uh, sometimes amazed that we ever win political elections, political campaigns, uh, given the tide of the culture. Uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb in the late 90s wrote a book called One Nation, Two Cultures. And uh, the one nation is, of course, the United States, and the two cultures are the dominant culture, which used to be the counterculture, and a more conservative culture, which he describes as a dissident culture, a culture of homeschooling and the like. And one culture is clearly on top. Uh, in an important sense, it does really take a village to raise a child, as Hillary Clinton said. And I think of the shaping institutions, or the formative institutions in America. Uh, what are they? They're the schools, of course, K through graduate school, or preschool through postdoc, if you like, uh, entertainment television, uh, the movies, the news media, popular music, publishing. These are all the formative, the institutions we learn from, I learned from. And they're all left dominated. And someone quipped a few years ago, I'm not sure it was just a quip, uh, what do conservatives have? Talk radio, country music, and NASCAR. <clears throat> you can't do a lot with that. I believe that for now, for the foreseeable future, uh, conservatism and the Republican Party are yoked. Uh, the conservatives, the Reagan conservatives certainly, uh, gain control of the Republican Party sometime in the late 1970s. And most of us in the Republican Party, we're, we're all Reaganites now. But parties do shift. Uh, they've shifted in living memory. Uh, our two major parties have shifted on foreign policy, on Israel very much, on trade, on color consciousness and color blindness, and to a degree on abortion. Uh, Planned Parenthood was full of people we used to call country club Republicans. Uh, there is much fretting over the Republican Party and conservatism, and I think some fretting is justified, but not too much fretting. It's not as though we have to meet in a phone booth. It's true we've lost the last two presidential elections, and we don't have the Senate. When I say we, I mean Republicans, because I am one. Some conservatives will, are very proud. They thump their chest and say, I'm not a Republican, darn it. I'm a conservative. Uh, I am a Republican. I, I, I quote our, our old friend Bill Rusher, who said that uh, conservatism is the wine and the Republican Party the vessel and you can't have one without the other. The Republican Party controls the U.S. House and a majority of the governorships and a majority of the state legislatures. Uh, that's not nothing. I also think that many conservatives are addicted to self-examination. They examine their own navels and one another's navel, and I'm not sure this is all that healthful. Uh, the left really runs the country, certainly the culture, and I think we ought to engage with the left more than we do. The conservatives love factionalism and internecine warfare. And let me caution against belief in permanent victories or permanent defeats. There is um, there's something cyclical in politics. I remember a time, I've been thinking about this in the last few days, when Margaret Thatcher had slain the Labor Party. She had finished off the Labor Party. It was a mere rump. Thatcherism had triumphed over Labor. And then uh, Major won, and Tony Blair won in 1997, and he won two more times. And all the talk was, will the Tories ever win again? And I also remember when, the, when Reagan and the modern Republicans had finished off the Democratic Party. The Democrats were going to go the way of the Labor Party in Britain. We all said that a hundred times. Ha, ha, ha. We said the following line a thousand times, that the Democratic Party rests on three pillars, uh, labor unions and, and public sector, unions at that, uh, Hollywood, and aggrieved minorities. And that wasn't enough. And boy, were we cocky in saying that. And then the question was, will the Republicans ever win again? So Obama wins in 2008. It's the end of the world for the right. And then there's this Tea Party movement in 2010, the biggest Republican year, I think, since the 1920s. And the Tea Party movement is something that really shocked me. I quote my friend Lou Cannon, who's been covering American politics since the 1960s, early 1960s, and he said he'd never seen a veritable grassroots movement. He never thought he'd see one in America. He said the Nixon people used to organize things and call it grassroots, but they were organized. This was a genuine grassroots movement, and I thought that America 
might go quietly onto social democracy, really. I thought people had given up on the old Ameri American Republic, that the, that the flow of education was all in the other direction. And who could ever even learn these values and principles? I had barely, barely encountered them until I was in my late teens. But uh, the Tea Party people pushed back against this. And they said that maybe the government shouldn't spend more than it takes in. And maybe we should look again at the Constitution and use it as a guide. And of course, they were immediately demonized as, as racist and other bad things. This is what happens. So I'm not entirely pessimistic about my party's prospects, but uh, there is a dark side. And uh, a colleague of mine said the, the other day, sometimes it just seems like we're tapping on the brakes and the course of life is ever leftward. And we in our conservative sec uh, successes, we tap on the brakes a little bit. What was Reagan's great achievement on the domestic side? Well, there was the revival of patriotism, and I'll set that aside for a second. He was able to slow the rate of increase of the government. Hooray! That was the great achievement. Um, what is the meaning of forward when the Obama campaign uses as its slogan last year, forward? What do they mean? Lefter, more collectivist, ever bigger government, an ever shrinking private sphere. This is the Marxian view that these that these impersonal forces uh, hold sway. And forward means an ever bigger state. Uh, I, I don't know, but, but I, I feel I know this, that in a democracy, people get what they deserve, more or less, whether they know it or not. And you might feel sorry for the minority, but frankly, we have republicanism with a small r, and minority rights are protected. But in a free country, uh, the people have the kind of country they want. And if they want a, a social democratic country, if they want a more European style welfare state, they will have one. It's their choice. Uh, if the uh, entitlement culture, the grievance culture, the dependency culture, the Hollywood culture, the hookup culture, what some people call post-moral society, if the people want that, they will have it. I have a colleague who says, if people really wanted the schools to be better, they would be people really wanted entitlement reform, we would have had it long ago. If people really wanted missile defense, it wouldn't have been stalled for so long. I think that. I think conservatives have two options, basically. They can um, make inroads into left-dominated institutions, and they can build their own, what some people call the counter-establishment, make the counter-establishment bigger. But I think that the Republicans and the conservatives should offer a choice, should put their point of view, should put Reaganism on the menu. And if the people don't want it, they won't have it. I happen to think that Mitt Romney was a splendid candidate and would have been a splendid president, one of the best we've ever had. I thought he was just the right man for the hour. Comes the hour, comes the man. And I thought he was just right. I'll never be able to prove it. I think he would have been a sterling president. But the country said no. They looked at Obama and Biden, and Romney and Ryan, and Ryan, and they said, we want that pair. Four more years, forward. It is their choice. And I am I'm so glad not to be a politician. And I frankly don't worship the people. I'm not a populist. I think the people are sometimes, in fact, often wrong. In the music they listen to, in the television they enjoy, in the movies they go to, and how they live their lives morally. I don't venerate the people. Sometimes they're wrong. And I hope that there are people who stand up for Reaganism and then offer it as a choice, whether it's popular or not. Thank you. I think what we'll do is invite people, I, I'm sure many of you have questions after listening to this, to come down to the mics and you can ask your questions. And while you're either formulating your question or getting ready to do that, let me just start, I'll, I'll, I'll use my uh, authority here as chair to, to ask a question of bo both speakers. And I, what I'd like, like them to do is this, um, I'd like each of them to stand back a bit from the presentations they've given, maybe this is the teacher in me, uh, who, to ask them to talk about what thinker or what political philosopher in their uh, reading and their experience best captures the conservative disposition or the conservative frame of mind. In other words, what should students uh, who may 
only know about conservatism from you know what they read online or in the newspapers or on radio, but don't have any necessarily deep foundation in the thought of conservatism, because there is such a thing. Uh, what should they be reading? And let me just make one caveat to you cannot use Burke. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. First, it's too obvious. And secondly, frankly, Burke does not speak to the American experience. Uh, you remind we, me, Stephen, once that, someone that said is, to me. That is to say, because if we were all Burkeans, we never would have embarked on this crazy exper and, and amazing experience that is the United States. So with that caveat, tell us a little bit about what thinkers you would recommend, bo book, thinker, you would recommend today for students who want to be serious about political conservatism? So we can go to the baseball game, and we can have a drink, but we can't have a beer. <laughs> uh, uh, for me, it was Burke. I'm sorry, and you're wrong about him. <laughs> D David, I, I want to tell you something. Once someone said to me, Stephen reminded me of this, said, um, name a great or good or worthwhile composer today, and you can't say Arvo Pert. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'll give a stab, though you're wrong about Burke. Uh, conservatism is about epistemological modesty in America or the continent. It's about living in a world more complicated than we can know and therefore being cautious about thinking we can plan around it. You take that away, there is no conservatism. So that's the foundation. But there is another American conservatism, which, as you say, is more daring. And so I guess I would go uh, to my other hero, Hamilton. And so uh, I'm going to give you his dates, but if you're in the faculty, uh, close your ears because I'm going to get some of the numbers wrong, but you get the idea. So Hamilton grows up in the Caribbean. When he's 12, he, um, his, well, his dad's run away. When he's 12, his mom dies in the bed next to him. He's adopted by his uncle who commits suicide within a year. He's adopted by his grandparents who both die within a year. So between 12 and 14, he's really lost everyone he loved except his brother. A court comes in, takes away all his property. So that's him at 14. By 25, he's George Washington's chief of staff and a war hero. By 35, he's written the Federalist Papers and become one of the successful uh, lawyers in New York. By 45, he's retired as the most successful Treasury Secretary in human history. And so here's a guy who believes in awesome mobility and who combined it with a tragic sense of life and a sense of realism. And so to me, Hamilton, I recommend reading the report on manufacturers. I recommend Ron Chernow's great biography, another one by Forrest MacDonald, on this philosophy of a realistic sense of America as the land of social mobility where government can play a limited but energetic role. And so if I had to do a really dumb breakdown of American <laughs> politics, it would be we have one party or one movement that believes in using government to enhance equality, which we call liberalism in this country. We have another which believes in limiting government to enhance freedom, which Jay just described. And then there's a third movement, which is using government in limited but energetic ways to enhance mobility. And so that would be my guy.